welcome everyone to the Town of Granby Board of Selectmen regular meeting for Monday, December 7th, as we do with all of our meetings. If you're able to, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, which stands for nation, on God, invisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. We got an F on unison. No, yeah. Well, man. Good at this. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, folks. One. All right. As we do, we have a public session, and we have uh, two speakers or three speakers uh, this evening. But if we could start with general public, any members of the public wish to address the board at this time? Hello? Yes, go ahead. State your oh, name hi. address, please. Yes, Hope Shafrick, 15 Maple Hill Drive. Um, I just wanted to make a comment um, after uh, hearing the retreat. I think it would be a fantastic idea if we could solicit um, the town's um, feedback in a survey to see, to try to engage more townspeople in the process and also to see what the town wants, um, you know, to do and some ideas that they may have. And we could do that through very simply through a survey monkey, or if people don't have access to a computer, we can also um, you know, maybe put it in the drummer or something and have a drop box. I think that would be a great idea. And my other um, comment is to the Mira Trash Facility. I know that it's going to be closing pretty soon, and I wondered if we could have a committee or a task force to see, you know, what we're going to do to address our trash situation situation to be uh, proactive and not uh, reactive. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Scott, it's Kate Bogley, 192 and 198 R Salmon Brook Street. Sorry, I don't know why I can't figure out how to raise my hand there. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. So um, thank you all so much for your time and your dedication to our town. At one point you mentioned, Scott, the lack, that lack of engagement on the public's part could be due to the fact that people think you guys are doing a great job. And I just, I was nodding yes as I was listening to that. I think that's definitely true. I think for the most part, our problems in town are kind of first world problems. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do better um, and, and also use all the resources we have. The question that's been going through my mind the last couple of meetings that I've been listening to is who holds the holistic vision for the town? I thought it would be the Board of Selectmen, but from what I'm hearing from your discussions, it doesn't seem like you guys think you are, but maybe I'm not clear on that. The audio from your um, retreat was not very clear, and, and honestly, I gave up listening to it partway through. Personally, I think you, our elected officials, should hold the vision for the town, and the town manager and the community development director should help guide and implement the town's vision. Um, I know our elected state officials are on the call, so I was wondering from them, I know they're going to give an update, if they could speak to maybe what they're doing to check in with the health and viability of the businesses in their representative areas. Um, I'd like to speak quickly to the governor's most recent orders, um, about places serving alcohol. My husband and I own a small brewery in Granby and have been affected most recently by the governor's guidelines requiring pa patrons to eat a meal in order to be served an alcoholic beverage. Um, however, eating a meal doesn't correlate to COVID transmission. Proximity is what correlates to COVID transmission. And that's why you've already made limits on our occupancy and created distancing requirements. Uh, this new regulation has made an already difficult time more difficult with no benefit to the community or increased safety. If there were people violating the distance requirements, please police that. Don't make new rules that would not that don't help keep people safe. We have a farm brewery with an 
acre of outside space approved by the state for alcohol service. In fact, we're seeing that people want to come sit outside in almost any type of weather, even yesterday when the temperatures were in the 30s. These sweeping regulations are killing small business. What are you guys doing about this? Thanks so much. Those are my comments. Great comments. Thank you, Kate. Anyone else wish to address the board? If so, um, state your name and address. Anyone? Go ahead. Was there someone wanting to speak? All right. Going once. Going twice. We will close general public public session, and we'll have an update. Uh, from, uh, I don't know if Senator Kissel is on the line, but we do have Senator Whitcoast and representative uh, elect Mark Anderson. Welcome gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for your time. So I evening. guess we'll have Senator Whitcoast go first. Sure, evening Scott, uh, John and the members of the Board of Selectmen, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. And I just want to start off uh, an answer to uh, comment that Kate made, uh, you know, I was appalled at the um, the further clarification, I'll say, of the governor's executive order by the commissioner of DECD regarding um, what constitutes a full service food item, if you will. Uh, you know, they, they classify nachos as a as um, acceptable for food purchased, but a plate of French fries is not. Uh, you know, it, to me, it's, it's not health related. Uh, why the Department of Economic Community Development is implementing these guidelines is beyond me. It should be the Farming the Valley Health District. Uh, why close everybody out, clear restaurants out at 9.30 at night? What's the difference between 6.30 and 9.30 or 10 o'clock? You know, you're still abiding by all of the criteria that you have to. Uh, <clears throat> this morning, I authored a letter to David Lehman, the commissioner of DECD, asking him to further explain how uh, any um, how he reached these decisions and did any health metrics uh, came into his decision making. And if so, could you point to them for me so I can have a better understanding as to why we're going in that direction? Um, you know, we're super busy at the Capitol. <clears throat> Mark and I were on with uh, members of the uh, Granby School Systems earlier today, uh, teachers talking about what they're seeing in their in their classrooms. And um, it, it because of the spike, I think that a lot of people are paying it more attention now um, you know, we are held, uh, there's no regulations that the, the legislature can override. These are all implemented through executive orders that the governor has uh, sole authority to implement uh, without review by the legislature. Uh, those authority, um, that authority expires February 9th. So we'll see what happens uh, after that. My guess, what I'm hearing is that it may be extended for another 60 days, um, especially if we're in, in, in the higher um, positivity rate level. And that will, I think, laser focus the legislature on certain bills, which we will be meeting most likely virtually at the beginning of our session, which uh, commences in January um, and going forward. So all the bills, the pet bills are the bills that really people want to see, but they really don't have huge impact on our economy and our, and our, and our uh, residents health wise, we'll just go by the wayside to the second year. So I, I think that may be some strategy somewhere. Um, I'm here inklings of that. So we go back in, I think January 6th, uh, it'll be virtual at this point until we hear otherwise. Uh, I know that financially um, I have a meeting, I'm on a, a finance revenue and bonding committee and we are meeting with the appropriations committee this Thursday at 11 a.m to kind of get an overview, uh, it's called a fiscal accountability report to see what our tax collections rates are, uh, what did we build into our budget for anticipated, how close are we to actuals, and what do we expect for final and earnings um, you know, for the fourth quarter this year. And, and you know, we're getting into the highest sales tax um, <clears throat> bracket because of the holiday spending. So we'll see, are we on target for that? or not. So um, I think that's going to have a huge play on where, where we go from there. So I'll turn it over to Mark if he has any comments he'd like to add. Then I'll take questions. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, as 
Um, Mr. Conley said, I'm representative elect. I get sworn in January 6th. It's been like drinking from a fire hose, getting the orientation and um, information from caucuses and hearing from lobbyists and constituents. Um, I'm looking forward to defending local and interest and business interest and supporting proactive growth um, policies. I do believe that the uh, emergency should be ended as soon as possible. And a lot of the things that governor's declaring could be advisories rather than dictates. I know he's destroying the small, small businesses. I know there is a lawsuit out there. I don't know the details. Um, that is another way, but I'll publish them on my you know campaign website for now. But uh, I know there is a lawsuit challenging the orders um, in favor of businesses. Um, but I think we're killing the goose that kill, um, laid the golden egg. Uh, um, so I'm very sympathetic to the businesses and I've been hearing from them and looking forward to all your suggestions and how I can represent you better. Great, thank, thank you both. Um, we do have some uh, questions from uh, the board. Let me just start by, if you could just tell us both what some of your legislative goals are for the upcoming session. Kevin? Well, I have a couple um, issues that um, I tried to work on last session, but we got closed down because of COVID. So I'm gonna be bringing those back up again. And one of those is was a subject matter of one of the, um, one of your board meetings, which is the uh, <clears throat> statewide ordinance against intentionally feeding uh, bears. I hope to have um, that move through this next legislative session. Um, I, I've heard from a lot of businesses in the, in the um, private sector, if you will, that there's a barrier that the state has created uh, as far as apprenticeships go. Um, they would love to bring on more apprentices uh, to get more uh, journeymen into the, in the pipeline or uh, build up these businesses that uh, folks are aging out and pretty soon we're going to have a deficit in, in the trades. So I wanna do something. I had a bill last year, I'll be working on that again uh, this year. Um, a lot of the stuff we'll be doing may be uh, defense. I, I know that uh, medic, uh, recreational marijuana will be um, a, a topic that we'll be taking up this next legislative session. And uh, I, the House of Representatives in Congress has, um, from what I understand, has decriminalized it. So, um, you know, with that in mind, if it ever gets through the, the federal Senate and the president uh, signs it, then we need to have a, a um, regulatory body in place to uh, administer this. So uh, working with, uh, I serve on the general law committee, so the Department of Consumer Protection, that's who oversees the medical marijuana program in, in our state. So we need to be ready for that. And I think that's gonna be a huge topic of discussion. Uh, online sports betting is another topic of discussion. I think any way to increase revenue uh, into the state coffers, which are not in the form of a tax um, <clears throat> burden, again, is something that we'll all be looking at. I know that there's been calls to raise uh, the income tax on, on the wealthy in our state. The governor, uh, rightfully so, has resisted that because we do already have a progressive income tax in, our, in the state of Connecticut. The more you make, the more you pay. Uh, we've already implemented that here. So um, and we have to remain competitive uh, against our neighboring New England states. And um, I saw recently I, I reported calling me about raising the gas tax, you know, because to offset our, uh, our decline in revenues for our transportation funding. I am not supportive of that. Uh, you know, we pay too much in, in the gas taxes already. You know, when we all benefit by the get price of gas being low at the pumps, the state is blaming um, <clears throat> the industry, if you will, saying, well, you've cut our money, so now we're gonna make the people that buy the gas pay more so we can offset ourselves. And I just don't think that's the way to go. Um, there's other plans that have been introduced out there that'll address uh, concerns for our road safety and our bridges and uh, be looking at that. So a lot of it's defense to see what we're gonna do, but a, a lot of the things is, is moving forward. I, I think, you know, I'm very happy that uh, to live in our state and grow up in this area and um, you know, I wanna stay here, but we've got to make Connecticut affordable and we've got to make sure that um, you know we can do whatever we can to help our residents out. And that's one of the things that I'm gonna be looking at. This, this session, I'm, I'm 
just so you know, I'm assigned to the general law committee. I remain on the finance revenue and bonding committee. I'm doing an internship this year and I actually am moving over to the ranking Senator on the higher education committee. And I, I want to dive into that because I think uh, uh, that system in light of COVID is really hurting for dollars. So I, I think we really need some leadership on that committee. And I, I think I'm one of the persons to do that. So be working with, um, uh, the president of UConn and, and the president uh, soon to be of the Board of Regents for our community colleges and our state colleges to figure out how do we go forward. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you. I did get um, the top three committee assignments I asked for, uh, labor, commerce, and veterans. So um, as far as labor, it addresses the public employees as well as um, private um, I spent 32 years as a federal employee, and they, we, federal employees were formed in 83. So I think there needs to be long-term regulation that there is less that the public employees can bargain for, which is true in most states, um, to get control of costs there. Um, I think the prevailing wage law has to go, and I would hope that all the towns would agree. Um, very few people benefit from that. Um, I know it greatly increases town costs, and I did have a long discussion about that today with other Republicans on the Labor Committee, um, House Republicans, but I'll support and try to be, um, I'm hoping, you know, I don't, I'm a new le new legislator, but I, my philosophy is to go on offense to the greatest degree possible. I mean, the things that will lead to economic growth are not partisan. Um, they can be well demonstrated by simple laws of economics, so to the degree I can do it. I'm going to propose proactive <clears throat> things, um, getting training on legis submitting legislation over the next couple of weeks. Um, but so I would, uh, I don't agree with the Family Medical Leave Act tax. Um, it's unsustainable on uh, the half percent that's going to be added, um, nor the increases in minimum wage. They're all going to be growth killers. So I'm going to take a proactive pro growth uh, approach. Um, I did uh, get involved with the bear issue. Um, I do support, you know, outlawing bear ba baiting, but also I do support limited bear hunting. Uh, I've seen how little in impact it has in Massachusetts as far as nobody even knows it's happening. It's only a $5 permit. Um, so it doesn't, it's not going to be anything what the opponents think it will be. Um, so I do support that. I know that's a big issue. Uh, in Heartland, lesser degree in Granby. Great, thank you. I do have one more question, then I'll open it to the rest of the selectmen. Um, with the trash to energy facility, um, this is probably geared more toward you, Kevin, because of your history, but with that facility closing, what is the state doing to help the communities that use that facility? <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, as you know, Scott, this has been an issue I've been trying to work on for the past four or five years, and um, right. it just isn't going anywhere. That the, the uh, commissioner of DEP uh, doesn't want the mirror plant to um, to be continue in operation. The mayor of Hartford doesn't want it there, so uh, everything is against the plant. So in the interim, they're looking at making it a. Um, a transfer station, if you will. And uh, right now, the it's cheaper to have our trash hauled out of state. Um, we cannot accommodate uh, more tonnage in our state at our other facilities. So uh, I think talking to many contacts and conversations with the commissioner is that they're going to create programs, maybe pay as you throw, um, taking out solid uh, food, food waste out of that to hit, to um, send to um, bio um, um, trash to energy plants, uh, not, not trash, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anaerobic digestive um, plants, and yeah. so I, I think they're trying to reduce the the tonnage, and then believe that we can move forward uh, of just doing out of state. But to me, I think that if the end result is that our, our Connecticut's garbage is being buried in some other state. It's just not good. Not, you know, yeah, I, I just don't support that. I think we, you know, we need to uh, maybe have conversations with Covento or some of the other um, 
energy plants in our state to say, how much can you take in tonnage? And we have it shipped there uh, through our haulers at this point. But I, I've not been privy to that. But I know that I this is a subject matter that I'm very close to and I'll be monitoring uh, very closely during the next legislative session. Yeah, great. Thank you. Any other selectmen have questions? Scott, if I could. You bet, Mark. Yeah. Uh, as a commuter, I was concerned last session when the uh, uh, option came up to institute tolls on the roads, particularly for me, 91 into Hartford. Uh, is there a likelihood that that subject to be revisited in this session? Mark, I don't think so. I think the governor has signaled that um, he doesn't want to bring it up again unless he, he may uh, secretly do a, a head count of votes uh, in the House of uh, Representatives to see if their votes are there because he's not going to, uh, and rightly so, he's, he's not a dumb guy. He's, he's the governor. Uh, he's not going to put his uh, political capital out there again if he knows he doesn't have the votes to pass it. So it'll, that those discussions will be had behind closed doors. So if you don't hear anything, then it's not going to happen. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, uh, first of all, Kevin and Mark, uh, congratulations on your uh, recent election wins. Um, and uh, Mark, I know you're the, the new one in town, so uh, or on the on the state level. So good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> couple things. Um, you, you mentioned the payroll tax. Uh, that's a pretty big hit to most people. It's a half a percent that's coming off. You said you're going to, you know, fight it. But I guess my, my view is that once a tax uh, <laughs> comes into being, it never goes away. It only goes up. What, what do you, what do you mean that you're going to fight it? Well, I think it'll it'll fall apart on its own in 2022 when people file for more leave than is financed, and then so I do think the way to approach it is the Republicans need to define their comprehensive approach because the only way we're going to get ourselves out of the deficits and um, long-term liabilities is economic growth. And the only way that we're going to grow is to make it more friendly to people and businesses and to shrink government. So, you know, as Republicans, we're in defense, have limited power, but I, I think that the public, when they look at that hidden their text, you know, I think the opposition will grow and, you know, let's say, we're six months into uh, 2022, and all of a sudden the fund is bankrupt. You know, the population isn't going to have the appetite to uh, increase it. So I think we need to make it an issue early that we want it repealed. The Re Republicans have already gone on record that the governor should use executive order to suspend that as well as the minimum wage increase. We just got to get the traction that the, you know, that the people turn against it. Well, I, I agree with your analysis that um, it will definitely be underfunded, but I guess I see the way out would be that they would increase it, unfortunately. And I, and I hope you're right that we can fight it and even get it repealed because my view was, uh, and I stated this two years ago when it got passed, that nobody knew about it, but they're going to figure it out pretty quick in January in their first paycheck and see that extra half percent taken right. out. And I think uh, at that point, people will realize that they're getting taxed, additional tax and not even know it. Uh, gas tax, as you mentioned, has come up uh, a number of times um, because gas prices are low today. Um, although, you know, futures, et cetera, are pointing to higher gas prices in a fairly, you know, uh, near future. Um, do you think a gas tax is a pretty high probability or an increased gas tax? I don't have a good read on it personally, but I think, you know, the revenues, there's going to be big revenue shortfalls. So there'll probably be a budget that shows, you know, a lot of new taxes. Um, but I haven't heard much about the gas tax. I think the transportation fund, you know, I guess can get through a few more years before it's underfunded. But then we got some of the transportation fund goes to trains, you know, in Fairfield County that are 80 percent empty. So the money's not being managed well. Um, I guess the population's got to partly wake up. Um, but I haven't heard any, I guess I've heard rumors in the news about gas tech, but not from the Republican caucus yet. But one other thing I meant to mention, um, 
you know, there's raised bill from last session, uh, 5132, on trying to impose more control of local zoning. I printed that before this call. It's about 12 pages, and it's a little hard to decipher on one reading. I don't know if that's on the radar screen of the town yet, um, but the state's trying to impose a lot more control over local zoning, so we've got to keep an eye on that. And... Great. And, and I guess just, just one other thing, um, you know, with it, in the past, there's always been uh, discussions about uh, state union concessions to help with the budget process. Um, they typically fail. Is that back on the um, on the radar? Or is that any traction there? And and along with that, in the last couple of years, the state has also tried to take a run at um, you know surplus budgets that are that towns have. You know, well-run towns such as Granby, um, you know, has a has a general fund to maintain our high credit rating. In the past, the state has tried to take a run at those funds. So are they going to try and do that again? I mean, I'm not a legislator yet, but as far as the union, I know the big thing that's on the radar screen is that as many as 25% of the state employees might retire in the next two years. Um, I don't think the impact of that has been fully uh, assessed. Um, it'll be, um, maybe they'll only hire half of them back to keep the costs down. As far as concessions, I mean, w one thing, and when the, uh, when the House Republicans met to elect their leader, um, Vin Candelora was encouraging, saying that the House Republicans might be the governor's best friends because uh, if he vetoes something, they don't have quite enough votes in the House. So we may become allies of the governor to tighten our belts um, and to get some leverage against the unions. Uh, we can only hope. I know as far as, you know, there are the, the most progressives in, in the legislature are trying to make Granby an extension of Hartford. So worst case scenario, you know, they've got a big appetite for the surpluses in well-run towns like Granby. Well, I know there's no surplus, but um, so. Okay. And to piggyback on um, what Mark said, Ed, the, uh, the no layoff clause goes out the window uh, this year in 2021. So it gives the governor uh, more bargaining uh, power, if you will, at the, at the table, if he so chooses to go in that direction. So, you know, that remains to be seen what, what he does with that. Um, I'm not sure when most of the union contracts are up for renegotiation. I think that's the 2022. I, I could be wrong, but I think that's the year. And it's like 16 different bargaining units. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But everybody tends to blame the unions uh, on this, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, they're negotiating – in good faith, just like the governor supposedly negotiates in good faith. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the problem lies in the board of mediation and arbitration where stuff gets overturned left and right. And that's where we really need to see some demonstrable changes. Um, and, and that impacts at the local level too, because, you know, if you remember the union, you file a grievance and it goes all the way through and the board of mediation and arbitration <clears throat> decides, uh, and then, you, you know, it, and it's hard to fight that and overturn one of the decisions. So there's that. And then um, as far as, um, you know, what's going to happen um, going forward, I'm not so certain that um, the governor it wants to, uh, you know, he's going to be up for reelection in two years and he, he likes being the governor and, um, he doesn't want to alienate his his base, but he also wants to make sure that Connecticut is on the right path. And I think he honestly tries to do the right thing. I think sometimes he's pressured, and I think what Mark said is absolutely correct, that the House Republicans are going to be able to be the block if he decides to veto something. Um, and But honestly, it would never matter because there's never been an override of a veto of the governor from the same party. Um, there were bills that passed years ago with Governor Malloy, unanimously the governor vetoed, and we couldn't even override it, even though it passed, you know, 100%. Um, so that remains to be seen, but we'll, we're just going to figure out where we go from there. Great. Thank you. Oh, th else? Thanks for your comments. And, and you, you kind of led into my final question, which was, 
um, any <clears throat> changes or overhauls to the binding arbitration, because you're correct, it, that is very impactful at the local level, whether it's uh, union negotiations, union, um, uh, other union issues, et cetera. That it, that it is a very costly mechanism that's in place. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, not with the makeup of the legislature, I, you know, um, Scott and, and prior to him, um, uh, they, they came uh, to the legislature for prevailing wage. And it was only till the Senate was tied 1818, where we got some leverage to change uh, up the, the numbers for the prevailing wage laws. I, you're not going to get anything done as far as binding arbitration goes in the state, not with the makeup of the legislature today. I hate to be the downer, but I'm trying to be the realist right here. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. You all set? Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Anyone? No? Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I hope, uh, seeing how you're both Republicans, I'll say this. I hope the Republicans do put up somebody uh, with uh, experience and the ability to uh, beat the governor so we get some conservative values moving forward uh, in the Do you state. accept the nomination, Scott? <laughs> Not me, but I'm, I'm, of all the people I've heard of that are running, unfortunately, I don't think anyone has the experience or, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but, um, I've, and I've heard a few people on the Republican side that are thinking of running. Um, so hopefully we get somebody out there who uh, can do the job. So uh, with that, thank you, gentlemen, for showing up tonight and answering our questions. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice holiday. Thank you too. You too. You too. All right. Let's see. Now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Hennick, who's the Public Education Officer at the Freedom of Information Commission. In that role, Tom travels around the state conducting FOI seminars, workshops, and educating members of the public, as well as public officials, about their rights and duties uh, under the Act. Tom also spends a great deal of time on the telephone uh, as we all do now, answering questions about the act raised by uh, general public. His background is in journalism. He was a newspaper reporter and editor from 1976 to 2001. He resides in Durham with his wife, Nancy. He's a former member of the town's board of selectmen, a former chairman of the regional school district 13, Board of Education, and a member of the Nutmeg Financial MHC Board of Corporates. So with that, it's my honor to introduce uh, Tom Hennick. Tom, thank you for thank you, coming. Scott. Thank, you. thank you all for the invitation to join you tonight. You know, Mark got <clears throat> off uh, quickly, uh, Kevin, I mean. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> you should have suggested that he run for governor, you know? Well, you got, I know. Guy, I'm right? Hoping. I'm hoping. Give him a little push. He'd be, he'd be an interesting candidate. <laughs> uh, I've known Kevin for a while. He's uh, yep. he's up there doing a good job for you folks. You should uh, be happy to have him on your side. Uh, <laughs> as Scott mentioned, we do these these workshops uh, all around the state. Obviously, I'm not with you tonight. That would have been the preference, but COVID has kept us kind of at bay. I'm just, I'm still learning how to do these things virtually. I have to look behind me to see what's that one of my children isn't sitting there waving their arms or something like that but we'll try to give you a few minutes about FOI. Uh, folks, let's make it informal, interactive. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions as we go along. Uh, the idea when we do these sessions is not to beat you up, not to make you miserable. It's really to, to build your comfort zone when it comes to freedom of information, to answer your question, to give you the tools to work with so that when an issue comes up, you're not sort of flummoxed, you're not sort of fumbling around, you have a better idea, a better handle on, on what it is you should do when it comes to FOI. The, the purpose of this law, which by the way is, is 45 years old, well, it was uh, Ella Grasso's grandchild when she ran for governor for the first time. And that was in the middle of Watergate and she saw a real need to create a law where the citizens of Connecticut could have access to their public agencies. 
and it's a pretty simple law in, in theory. It's about access to public meetings and access to public records. And the idea is that, that the people need to know what's going on. The government doesn't work if people don't know what's going on, if their agencies aren't, aren't transparent. And so that's, that's why this law was put into place. Now, when you read it, uh, it's not that simple. It doesn't quite resonate because to get it passed, to get everybody on board, there had to be a lot of compromises. So you've got a law that's based on a, on a simple concept, but it has a lot of gray area in it. And, and John Ward can probably talk to you about that. You know, you look at it and you say, okay, it's about open government. I know it's about open government. This is what we should be doing. But that doesn't seem to quite resonate with me. It doesn't seem to make sense. They're telling me that this is a record that I don't have to give out or that I shouldn't give out, or that this is a meeting that you would think would be in public, but it's not. Because the legislature created some areas where you, who are on front line, and, and as you heard, I was once on the front line myself, have to make decisions. You have to decide what to do. And sometimes you're asked to make those decisions on the fly, and, and you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're actually violating the law. And by the way, you know, just to be clear, the FOI Act is the law in the state of Connecticut. When we violate it, we're violating state law. Um, so the idea would be that you get the tools to work with so that, you've, that you feel better, you feel more comfortable about you know, your role when it comes to freedom of information. It's about two basic things. It's about access to public meetings and access to public records. I'm gonna hit primarily the meetings provisions tonight, but if I don't touch on something that you're curious about or that you wanna know about, please ask. I'm happy to, happy to try to answer your questions. The, the idea behind the public meetings provisions is to make sure that our public agencies do their work in public. Um, that, idea has been uh, under stress since COVID hit back in March. Uh, we can't meet in person anymore. You know, you're all at your homes or in your offices and, and we're trying to keep safe. We're trying to stay out of the way. So the governor back in March put in some provisions that sort of stretched the, the limits of FOI. It allowed for these virtual meetings. But if you'll notice, if you look at it carefully, the executive order that he put forward, there's a requirement that there still be real-time access to the public. They can't be there watching you necessarily, but there's gotta be a link so that if you're on Zoom or if you're doing it via teleconference, that they can at least listen, that they can hear what you're going to do, see what you're going to do. And then they also have the right to see a recording because the law requires you to record the meeting and make sure it's available uh, to the general public the next day, or I'm sorry, within seven days. But the basic premise is to make sure that your meetings are open. But a lot of people say, well, gee, couldn't we just have a little discussion without worrying about FOI, without following that law? And the answer really is no. Uh, let me read for you the definition of a meeting so that you get a, an idea how broad the legislature intended this to be. Meeting means any hearing or other proceeding of a public agency, any convening or assembly of a quorum of a multi-member public agency, and any communication by or to a quorum of a multi-member public agency, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment, to discuss or act upon a matter over which the public agency has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. It's pretty broad. It wants to make sure that when you gather to do your work, your assigned tasks, you're having a meeting and you understand that, which means the meeting needs to be properly noticed. It needs to be open to the public. There need to be minutes when the meeting is done. People say, well, let's, let us form a little subcommittee. That's not the full public agency. But when you read the definition of a public agency, which is too long for me to read tonight, there's a phrase in there that says, including any committee of or created by. So you're on a 10 member board, you create a three member subcommittee saying, well, it's not a quorum, it's not the full board. That official subcommittee becomes a public agency and needs to follow the same rules. The law really is expanded to make sure that the people see what's going on. So like I said, you need to notice it properly. It needs to be open to the public. There need to be minutes when you're done. When I say notice, you have to prepare an agenda before every meeting. The agenda, by the way, I don't know if the agenda preparer is in the room here. You need to make sure it's specific. We've had multiple court cases where boards, commissions have been chastised for not being specific on their agendas. You know, we use items sometimes like old business, new business, other business. They're not great for agendas. They're really not. But there are times when you can use them. Now, there's, there's two basic kinds of meetings that you'll probably deal with most of the time when you serve on your board of selectmen. There's a regular meeting, there's a special meeting. 
regular meeting is the meeting that you have per schedule. I suspect, I, I heard, I thought I heard that tonight is a regular meeting. You meet on the, it looks like on the first and third Mondays of every month. That's your regular meeting time. A special meeting is a meeting that you have when you're not scheduled to meet. Uh, it, there's nothing really special about it, to be honest with you. It's just not falling on the time when you're regularly scheduled to meet. So difference, regular and special meeting, that agenda that I was talking about, again, specificity. But at a regular meeting, you use that old business, new business, not the greatest thing, but at least the chairman can say, is there any other business? Is there any old business? And one of the other selectmen can say, yes, it's not on the agenda, but I would like to talk about X. It's important that at that point you make a motion, you vote to add it to the agenda by a two thirds vote of those board members who are present, and then you go ahead and talk about it. At a regular meeting, you can do that. But at a special meeting, you can't. So if you're, if you're sort of using a template, cutting and pasting to put together your special meeting notice and you have an other business on there and there's nothing listed underneath, you can't go to that. Someone can't just bring it up and say, hey, let's talk about this because you can't vote to add anything to the agenda of a special meeting, only at a regular meeting. And folks, I need to stress that if you have something that comes up, let's suppose, I, I noticed you have public comment, which, you know, that's fine. Let's suppose something during public comment came up, you wanted to talk about it. If it's gonna be any, anything other than a brief acknowledgement or, or, or a board member brings something up, always vote to add it to the agenda. <clears throat> Because if you if you slip on that, you, you may have a problem and you don't you just don't want to deal with that. Okay? So your regular, your special meetings, you you have your agenda. They need to be available at least 24 hours in advance. They need to be available. You need to make sure that it's in your office. And you know, during these times with, with COVID, I would recommend getting it on your website. That's not a requirement for a regular meeting. But especially if you're going to be virtual and you want to get that that link out, that Zoom link out uh, to as many people as possible, you want to make sure that, that you've taken care of that as well. Now, there's a third kind of meeting, and I'll just touch on that briefly. There's an emergency meeting. Emergency meeting is a meeting that I always discourage boards and commissions from using because it's not noticed. And the problem with those is that there are what you and I think might rise to the level of an emergency isn't necessarily an emergency in the eyes of the law. Uh, you know, my best story about that is we have some holidays in Connecticut that where town halls are closed, that some people, they sort of sneak up on people. You know, Martin Luther King's birthday, Veterans Day, they just sort of, people re don't realize that things are closed. And I've got a call the next morning, inevitably every year, and by the way, I'm, I'm, we'll, it'll be 20 years next month, um, Somebody will say, Tom, I've got a problem. I'll say, what's the problem? They'll say, look, our regular meeting is tonight. And I always bring the agenda in 24 hours in advance as I'm required to do. But I forgot that the town hall was closed yesterday, so I didn't bring it in. I brought it in this morning. Is that okay? And the answer is no, it's not okay. It's not 24 hours. That's a hard and fast rule. They said, well, we've got too much to do tonight. And, and believe me, as a former town official, I get that. So we're going to call it an emergency. Well, oops, I forgot it's not an emergency. And I've seen, you know, people say, well, what happens if we mess up on the meeting notice or we, we add items to the agenda we're not supposed to? The Freedom of Information Commission, which was created as part of this law, is where people go when they believe they've been denied the rights, the access that the, that the law guarantees them. And one of the things I've seen is people say, look, the meeting didn't properly notify me as to what was gonna happen, what they were gonna talk about. And I've seen our commission invoke one of its strongest powers, which is to declare null and void something that happens at a meeting. So imagine being at a meeting and taking care of an important, you know, important topic, healthy discussion, vote, and then somebody says the meeting was improper and goes to the FOI commission and said, look, they were trying to, to hide something from us. The commission buys it and, and declares it null and void and makes you go back all the way to the, to the beginning and do it over again. That's why, that's why that's not what the law isn't, isn't intended to be punitive, but if it gets serious, that's what, that's what could happen. Uh, you know, remember that your meetings, as I said, are open to the public. Anybody can come. You don't want to start, hey, you're from Heartland. What are you doing here? Anybody can, can come to a meeting. Anybody can uh, record a meeting. I, I suspect that's not as big a deal as it used to be when they wrote this law. Here's a, one part. Uh, this law, the FOI law, does not guarantee anybody the right to speak at a public meeting. Many people think that it does. 
It doesn't. Now you have public comment, I noticed on your agenda, most boards do, but it's not a requirement. So how you handle it, what you do with it, how long it is, how much you want people to speak, how long you let them speak, or whether or not you uh, limit it to certain topics, that's entirely up to you. You have a right to control that. So talking about operating in the open, I mean, that's the big thing, making sure you do your work in public. When, you, when I read you the definition, it said, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment, especially today when we're all sort of holed up in our own little homes and offices, electronic equipment means this. It also means email. It also means text. Folks, it doesn't mean that you have to abandon use of those devices when you are trying to communicate with each other, but do not conduct business via email. The chairman wants to send out a, an email that says, hey, this is how I feel about this issue. I want to talk about it at the next meeting. That's fine. The problem comes when, you know, another member, uh, I'm looking at names here, Glenn or Sally writes back and says, that's stupid, Scott, we can't do that. And you start a dis disagreement, an argument that you should be having here at the meeting. Do not have the deep deliberative conversations via electronic equipment on the phone, via email that you should be having in public. Many, many boards get into trouble with that as well. You say, well, how can people know? The emails become public records. Somebody wants to see those emails. You have to produce them. Bingo, you, it's, there's proof that you've had an, an improper meeting. Be careful the extent to which you use those devices. Use them to communicate. Talk about agendas. Share ideas, but don't engage. Don't have the discussions that you should be having at your meetings here tonight. Another thing to remember about the meetings provisions is that it does give you some latitude as far as excluding the public. You know, if, you've, if you're veterans of this board, and I think most of you are, it allows you to go into something called executive session. Remember that an executive session is a part of a publicly noticed open meeting. It's not something that sits on an island by itself. You may have a, a meeting where the only item is an executive session item. You still need to convene in public. You need to vote to go into executive session, again, by a two-thirds margin of those of you who are present, citing the reasons specifically. There's five of them. I'll talk to you about them in a second. You go into executive session. You have your discussion. And always come out to vote, folks. Do not ever take action behind closed doors. The law is very specific. You must vote in public, and your votes need to be recorded and included in the minutes. Five reasons for executive session. A personnel matter pending claims or pending litigation, a security matter, a property transaction. The fifth one is a little broader. It's something of a catch-all. It allows a board or commission to have a conversation about a document or documents that it believes are exempt from disclosure. Uh, a good example of that would be, let's suppose you need a legal opinion from your attorney. You ask the attorney for a written legal opinion. He or she gives it to you. You are the client. It's covered by the attorney-client privilege. You're not going to share it with anybody. You can go into executive session to talk about the advice that your attorney has given you. Let me just back up to the personnel executive session for a second. Remember that when you're noticing it, first of all, you can't just say executive session personnel. The courts have come down pretty hard on that. They said you need to give us more. You don't necessarily have to name the individual. But executive session plan, discussion of the performance of a police officer, discussion of the performance of a public works employee, discussion of the performance of a land use office employee, a little more, not necessarily the name. You also then have to notify the individual in advance that he or she is going to be talked about in an executive session. And if the person says, no, 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 wait a minute, I don't want that to be an executive session. I want it in public. You cannot go into executive session. You must have that discussion in public. What the person can't then do is say, wait a minute, I don't want it in public, but if you're talking about me, I demand to enter the executive session with you. That's not a right that the person has, although intuitively, if you think about it, gee, they're gonna talk about me, I gotta be in the room, right? Wrong. The law says that once the person waives that right to an open executive session, it's up to you whether or not you invite the person in. You're never in obligated to invite anybody into any executive session unless you want to, to, to hear what they have to say, to hear their evidence, to hear testimony, to use their expertise. You go into executive session, you have your conversation, and then you come out. 
There's another path that boards and commissions can use. The legislature took certain things off the table. Said, look, they may look like meetings or smell like meetings, but for the purposes of freedom of information, they're not meetings. What do I mean by that? They say that there's certain things that you can do that don't fall under the requirements of FOI. Collective bargaining. Do we have unions in Granby? You have to negotiate with them. You can do that without notice, without being open. Executive level search committees. A high level employee retires. You wanna look for a new person. You can do that outside of freedom of information. Those are just a couple of examples. Last thing I'll, I'll talk to you about when it comes to meetings is minutes. Minutes required very little actually. The only requirement for minutes legally is a record of who votes for what or for whom. I always say, look, minutes need not be the recreation of war and peace. They are not every word that everybody says. They need not be a verbatim transcript. You know, how you handle that is up to you, but a clear record of the votes, obviously you're creating Granby's historical record. You want more than that in there, but how much more is your call? You get to make that decision. Make sure those minutes are available in seven days. I'll spend just a minute on, on records and then I'll, if you have any questions, that's fine. We just remember this, anytime you create a record in the conduct of Granby business or collect a record in the conduct of Granby's business, it's defined as a public record. And in theory, anybody can ask to see it. Anybody can ask to get a copy of it. Now, that being said, there are various exemptions and exclusions, far too many to talk about in a, in a 20 minute block of time. John can help you with that. Your, prof your professionals in town hall can help you with that. Bottom line is though, you need to comprehend that you're creating a public record. Okay, it's a public record. Is it a record that I wanna see on the front page of the current? So you always think before you write, think before you send it. I'll tell you a little, a little anecdote. I took a call a couple of weeks ago from a woman. She says, hi, my name is Sean. I said, hi, Sean, how are you? She said, good. She said, um, I'm calling you from Georgia. Georgia. She wasn't calling about the Senate races or, or anything like that. She says, I, I'm, I'm calling you because my husband is an out-of-state contractor and he, he did a job in Connecticut last summer. And I think he had an affair with a state worker. <laughs> Why is she calling me? It wasn't me, right? She's calling me because she says, can I see that worker's emails and texts and her phone records? And the answer is, if, she cre if these records were created in the conduct of public business, the email from her <coughs> husband or from the, the project coordinator to the husband that says, meet me at the construction trailer at six o'clock. We will review the blueprints for the project. And then, you know, dot, dot, dot. Hey guys, that's a public record. She said, good, it'll help me with my divorce. <laughs> Think before you send. Think before you write, because you're creating a public record. Yes, it may be a record you don't have to release, but it's a public record nonetheless under the definition. I'm, I'm mindful of the clock and the fact that you guys have a meeting to take care of other business, having sat where you sit in my town. I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions, anything they want to talk about, ask about? Thanks, Tom. Um, any member of the board, any questions? Anyone? Not for me, Scott. Okay. Sure, I'll, I'll go. Oh, Glenn? Thanks. Um, so the, the law was probably, oh, why well, the law was written, obviously, at a time when we didn't have websites and electronic documents and, and things like that, at least in the formats that we do today. And <clears throat> so you just got through saying minutes don't have to be very uh, prescriptive. There's sort of a bare bones requirement for what's in them. But um, um, depending on how those minutes are stored or made available on the town website, let's say, for example, they can be um, not possible to search or possible to search. They can be categorized so they're easy to find or not categ or the, you know, not categorized so that you have to use the town the search bar and hope that you know, it brings the result that, that the person is looking for, et cetera. So <clears throat> I guess how, mo how modern are the interpretations of the law when it comes to that kind of stuff. Like this should be a lot easier to find than it is. 
great question. The, the law clearly has not caught up with technology. Um, the minutes requirements, you know, refer to uh, the bare bones that I mentioned and, and little else. The, the, here's a, here's a, a little irony. The, back in 2008, the legislature passed a, a, a law at Governor Rell's request that required all agendas, all minutes to be put on websites. And a lot of towns, especially some of the smaller ones, complained, we can't afford it, we can't do it. <coughs> and the legislature said, that's fine, but it's a good idea, you should do it. So they scrambled and they, and they, you know, there were costs involved, the personnel and the whole thing. So they went and did it. And then a year and a half later, the legislature said, never mind. It was an unfunded <laughs> mandate and took it back. So when the legislature actually had a chance to sort of move forward on technology, it moved forward and then it, and then it went back. Um, I think this, this pandemic induced move to allow the meetings virtually may lead to something along the lines of what you're talking about. But at this point, to, to be candid, there's nothing that requires you know, better search engines or, or better ability to find things on websites. It's just not there. Any other questions? Ed? Mark? No, Scott. <clears throat> Nothing for me, Scott. Sally? OK. Well, well a lot well, less questions you. than I thought, Tom. Thank you very much for I'm coming up tonight. Happy to do it. Let me just close with this. I, you know, you heard uh, in the introduction, I spend a lot of time on the phone answering questions, answering emails. What typically happens is we have a discussion like this, and then after I leave and hang up, you say, oh, I should have asked. Yeah. Do not ever hesitate to pick up the phone, ask a question, send an email. I'm not always going to have the answer. I'll get you one. It may not be the answer you like. It's not an order. It's not a command. Just as nothing I said here is you must do this. It's just recommendation. It's trying to, to give you aid, some hope. Help, not hope. Um, just just <laughs> understand that if, if we can help in any way, I want you to lean on us and we'll try to get you the answer that you need, okay? Tom, could you give us your uh, phone number as it's well? confidential. As, uh, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Freedom phone, of information. Freedom of information <laughs> phone number is 860-566-5682. Now, on a day like today, when I worked at home, we're not all in the office at the same time for obvious reasons. I retrieve the calls regularly. I, I've answered every call that came in today, for example. Nobody Great. was left un, un, unresponded to <laughs> That's the right way to say it. So anytime at all, folks. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. OK, we'll move on to approval of the public hearing minutes for November 16th. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstention motion carries unanimously. Uh, approval of the meeting minutes for November 16th. Is there a motion? So moved. Move that we... <laughs> okay, Sally. Move that we approve the meeting minutes of November 16th. Okay. Second. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries unanimously. All right, unfinished or tabled business. There is none on the agenda. We'll move to new business. Uh, John, any resignations? No. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I do have one correction. Yeah. Um, we actually don't have a vacancy on the library board that had been previously filled by the board and uh, it was <clears throat> our oversight. So library board is all set. We have no additional resignation other than what's listed here. Okay, thank you. Any appointments? Mark, are you aware of any? Uh, no, no appointments for the Republican board. Uh, Sally, are you aware? Committee. No, not aware of any. All right. So just to let folks know, uh, two positions for Conservation Commission and uh, one for Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Commission. All right, 
Moving on to item B, consideration of public hearing for sale of 11 and 15 North Granby Road. Mr. Ward, do you have additional information? Uh, not uh, more than it's in the memorandum, which I'll very briefly summarize. This is part of the center reconstruction project being conducted by the Connecticut DOT. I previously mentioned they were looking to um, purchase two more plots of land. These are the two. Uh, I do not expect any others. So it's a total of four, two you've already had a public hearing on, and then these two uh, on North Cranby Road uh, with the details in the memorandum. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Ward? Scott, I, I had a quick question. John, how are the values derived? They're derived by the state and, and frankly, they're not articulated too closely. And given the relatively low sums of money, I don't think it's cost effective to hire somebody to double check them. Um, but the, the state has their own appraisers and uh, rights of way specialists who come up with these numbers. But uh, again, I can't tell you what formula they use to calculate these. And is it standard procedure then for the town, especially these are small, small pieces to just kind of accept their valuations? That would be my assumption. Um, I'm not aware of specifics of how other towns have dealt with it, um, but certainly uh, there is a procedure in place. Um, let's say we're talking about the roundabout and it was private property owned by an individual and mm -hmm. it was a um, significant amount of land that was going to be taken. Right. They could appeal it to the state and ultimately if no resolution was available, there's a mechanism to take it to Connecticut Superior Court. So they... Um, do have an appeal process. I do not right. imagine that many towns have used it for this level of, of money because, frankly, whatever the dispute was, you'd wind up paying it in legal fees. Right. I, I just want to make sure that, you know, this is kind of standard procedure. I know there's small slices, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we're getting the most value that we possibly can out of these pieces. That's all. Yes, you are correct. It is the standard procedure. And the DOT does have a whole mechanism in place for the evaluation of right-of-way values. Great. Any other we, questions? Oh. Other questions? Okay. Uh, there's a proposed motion if someone wants to make that. Sure. I move that the Board of Selectmen hold a public hearing on the proposed sale of portions of the properties known as 411 and 15 North Granby Road and 3 East Granby Road to be held on January 4th, 2021. Is there a second? Second the motion. Is there a discussion? Do we also have to um, bring to public hearing the other two properties? Because we, we didn't discuss They're them. Included in They're on here. They're included in. They're included in this one. The motion. Oh, they are. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those abstentions, motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, consideration of additional gen general fund appropriation for Gorman and York contract. Uh, John? Yes. Um, as the board may recall, they approved the awarding of a contract to Goman in York, who responded to the bid, the, or rather the RFP, mm -hmm. for brokerage and market analysis services for Kearns. And the agreed upon price, as discussed at that meeting, was 
50,000 or 5% commission, whichever is higher, um, offset by a monthly retainer of $3,000. Um, the contract's been drafted. Goldman has signed it. Uh, it'll be awaiting my signature as soon as it's returned from Goldman. Um, but before I signed it, I wanted to make sure I had the money. Um, so this is a request for an appropriation from the general fund in the amount of $50,000. Uh, and this is due to the fact that a year ago, um, the brokerage fee was not put in the budget. And so otherwise, as it stands now, we don't have an appropriation to cover this. And before I sign the contract, I want to make sure I have an appropriation. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for town manager? Uh, sure. John, if I could. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Sorry. Go ahead Glenn. Oh, uh, well, so there's seven months left in the fiscal year, right? And it's 3000 a month. So does that mean we need $21,000, not 50? Or how would, that, how would that work? Well, the contract's going to run for a year. Um, so, but you'd fund that you'd fund, it would be funded essentially over two different budgets, right? Two different fiscal years. Um, if we get started now, 3,000 a month, seven I'm wondering, months it's, left. It's, it's actually yeah. six months, right? By the time it gets done. Yeah, no, that uh, I had not considered that point, but you are correct. But um, what we could certainly do is encumber the full amount at the end of the fiscal year so that it could not be spent on anything else and then it would not have to be uh, included in next year's budget. Right. Does the motion reflect that? No, the, uh, the motion is just asking for a straightforward appropriation of the 50,000. Well, you can encumber it later, right? Oh, yeah. So I don't need uh, a motion don't need from that the board the or the board. No, it, it, I mean, it. it's fairly standard practice. Utility right. bills are often encumbered when we know we're going to spend the money. Okay. Any other questions? Mark, you had a question? Uh, no, Glenn uh, uh, got my question out for me. So thank you, Glenn. Okay. Yeah, I, I had the same thing, and I guess as I as I mentioned, I think this has come up twice in the past that I, I'm I'm really opposed to going to the general fund for stuff that's unbudgeted, um, and I kind of took the same path that Glenn took, of you know three thousand dollars a month. Are we absolutely positive that? we're not going to return any money back to the general fund at the end of the year. We're not going to be budget transfers that, you know, we could find $18,000 this year. I guess my, my concept is we set a budget and that is the budget. And, you know, when we do these extra things, we should find money. You know, do we have contingency money for instance? Well, we're talking $18,000. We yeah. That's, you know, even the contingency is kept, pretty lean uh, you know in as every year obviously we don't want the taxes to go up more than they have to and i think realistically if i were to put 50 or 75,000 in contingency just under the scenario of what if you know that wouldn't live to see the light of february it would be cut pretty quickly um and, and i but we're running ahead of budget this year, right? Our revenues are higher. But, but one thing, if I may, I'm not allowed to spend money that's not been appropriated. That's against uh, our policies. So yep. if I spend this money and we don't, something catastrophic happens, a uh, category four hurricane and wipes out any money we thought we have left over, um, you know, I, I'm left hanging dry without authority to have spent the money that I've been obligated the town to spend by signing the contract. 
Um, but, it, but we won't. Yeah, but we won't spend. We won't spend more than eighteen or twenty-one, right, by the end of the year. And if we sell the property, it, it would be funded through the proceeds of the sale at that point, right? Whatever the differential is. Well, and that's true. But the other point I would put out for your consideration is historically we've returned the excess money. I mean, what you have not seen is, you know, a festival of purchasing in July. We, we don't turn right. out and buy, you know, new color copiers for everybody and their brother on June 1st. So I think while well, theoretically possible that we could hoard this money and spend it inappropriately, that has not been the track record and dollars to donuts be willing to bet that that was not the track record of my predecessor either. And again, if I sign this contract and you appropriate 21,000 and, and come June, you decide that you won't make the, the rest of the appropriation you know, the town's incurred a liability that we're not funding. But, but isn't that uh, typical of town states and the federal government that there's always appropriation risk when you do a contract with them? That's kind of a standard risk. Uh, no, um, they ex my experience has been they expect you to have the money secured before you sign the contract. Again, um, I signed the contract that's a legal obligation binding the town. And under our policy, anybody that appropriates money or spends money without a proper appropriation is in violation of the town fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a fair, that's a fair point. I, I guess the only other thing that comes up I'm, maybe it's related, maybe it's not, but I'm assuming that at any point along the way, we can terminate the contract if we're not happy with the um, the amount or the quality of the effort that we're getting, et cetera, right? And so, um, so we're there not- There is a termination we're, clause. Yeah, but so we're not really on the hook for 50, right? I guess is my point. We're on the hook for, we're on the hook for however many months they put in at three grand a month until, I mean, I understand what you were saying before about the risk of not funding the second part of it. But on the other, on the other hand, we have, a, we, we have a right and or there's a possibility that we might not go the whole way, right? Right, but that poss possibility would remain whether or not you fully appropriate at this point or not. Right. The other thing is you have to consider is what message are you sending the contractor? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, the contractor will be, I'm sure, very pleased to enter into a contract like this. They're not going to feel upset, but if we develop a reputation of signing contracts and underfunding them, in the long term, we're going to wind up with fewer people interested in doing business with the town, which will in turn drive up the cost. That's right. I, I don't think that's 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 really what we're talking about. At least not what, not what I'm talking about. To me, it's more of a, a prudent fiscal policy. And when we have these charges come up that we, we run to the general fund, but um, I, I understand what you're saying, John, and, and I guess, you know, we need to think um, real hard when we do next year's budget of what kind of extraordinary possible events are coming up, because this is the, the second one already this year. Um, and, and so I think we need to think about some sort of contingency for, for or something for next year. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And, and just an, one last point. It works both ways. Um, it does. We collected far more revenue than we planned in the budget, and we spent less than we planned on spending in the budget. Right. So 
not every swing or deviation from the set budget is negative. Some of it is positive. Right. Um, and, and I don't disagree uh, I, I with you. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think, yeah. I, I think at the end of the year, our goal is still to have a surplus, even, even including. Agreed. So I understand. All right. Um, would anyone want to make a motion? Sure. I move that the board of selectmen. I've got sure. it down the bottom. Yep. I move that the board of selectmen authorize an additional appropriation of fifty thousand dollars from the general fund balance to fund the Goldman and New York brokerage services contract, and forward this request to the board of finance to approve. Is there a second? Second the motion. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, consideration of waiver of general assistance liens. Mr. Ward again. <clears throat> well, the timing's not great on this one, but <laughs> this is really uh, a cleanup of old accounting. Uh, many, many years ago, the town administered general assistance or welfare assistance, and then the state took it over. While the town was administering general assistance, it would put liens on people's houses. Uh, in reviewing the existing liens, um, Social Service Director Sandy Yost and the town clerk Karen Hazen were able to find that there's three liens still on the property. Um, historically, Granby in the past has, when these have come up, <clears throat> have waived them, uh, including waiving the right of repay, uh, repayment. And essentially, the reason for that is it's state money that the state really no longer has a mechanism to collect the money. So if we were to hold on to this money, my concern is someday the state will come knocking on the door, I rate that we're holding on to their money. On the other hand, if we were just to collect it, there's not a mechanism to turn it over to the state at this point in time. Um, the state statute, does allow the Board of Selectmen to waive the liens and in part earn total. Uh, we're talking um, relatively small figures here, uh, I think. Um, yes, the total amount is $1,051. So it's my recommendation that the board does release these liens, which will clean up the title for these three homes. So if anybody wants to refinance or sell the house, uh, it'll be just that much easier. Now get granted, if they're refinancing or selling, they could have the liens paid back as part of the real estate transaction. But then again, we have the dilemma of holding on to the state state's money. Um, Maybe that'll offset the low ball figure they're giving us for the land. <laughs> oh, well. all right. Um, so before we get into discussion, is there uh, anyone who wants to make the proposed motion? I'll take care of that, Scott. Okay. Uh, the Board of Selectmen hereby authorizes the release of three remaining general assistance liens in whole without payment. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Discussion? Anyone? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item E, consideration of additional solid waste fund appropriation for brush grinding. Okay, Mr. Ward. Okay, um, and it's something I probably should have had Senator Whitko's address when he was on here wearing his other hat of Eversource. 
due to the large number of storms we've had in the last, I believe, four to six weeks, the transfer station has collected an enormous amount of uh, branches and brush uh, that has to be chipped down or has been chipped down, but we all, or it needs to be chipped down and then hauled away because at some point, A, it becomes a safety hazard as it can catch on fire and B, is beyond or approaching the limit of the DEEP regulations as to the storage of this at the transfer station. Um, Mr. Severance has found a contractor that would be willing to chip and remove this. And so he's requesting um, an appropriation from the solid waste fund, which is used to finance the removal of waste from the transfer station for this reason. Okay. I'll look for someone to read the proposed motion or make the proposed motion. I'll take care of that. Go ahead. Scott. Uh, I propose that the Board of Selectmen authorizes an additional appropriation of $7,000 from the Solid Waste Fund balance to fund the transfer station brush grinding project and forge this request to the Board of Finance to approve. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. We, we do this every year, don't we? Not this. Specifically, this. Oh, I thought we do. Yeah. Oh. It happens on a regular basis. I'm not sure it's every year. Yeah. yeah. It's just storm damage. Yeah. yeah. It is a really big pile. I was there the other week. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I contributed to it, so I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, any other discussion? No. Nope. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those extension motion carries. Thank you. Moving on, town manager's report. Um, I did uh, present a written report. I don't have much to add. I'll just reiterate probably the top news is I have switched the town hall hours to appointment only, uh, encouraging as much business as can be done via email. Um, phone or plain or ordinary mail. And that is due to the upsurge in uh, COVID exposures. Included in your packet is the latest map from the Department of Public Health. And you can see that Granby is now at the highest level of red, uh, similar to, um, I believe, 90% of the municipalities in the state. Uh, this transition has been uh, set forth for the month of December. Um, I'll look at it for the month of January. And then hopefully by that point, we're starting to come through this and come out of this. That every uh, statistic and metric I've seen over the last three weeks indicate that right now we're approaching the peak uh, of the COVID exposure season. And one, I want to protect the employees. Two, I apologize for inconvenience to the citizens, but we've had relatively few complaints. Um, people are able to still get the business done. The library will continue with their curbside pro um, program. Um, there were some people upset with it the library closing some people supported it as well which you know overall i expected that opinions would fall on both sides of this decision um we do have the january tax bills but the bulk of that is paid in july the foot traffic would not be as much uh, and again will incur or encourage everybody to pay uh, online if you need to make an appointment to, to see building plans, for example, or uh, records, uh, we will screen you uh, for any uh, problem, criteria, exposure, temperature, uh, mask is required, 
the town hall employees will be wearing masks uh, unless you're isolated in your own closed office. Um, you know, knock on wood, we have not had a case yet in the town, in the town hall, but it's something we have to be very cognizant about. We've been fortunate, very fortunate with our <clears throat> first responders, um, though we've had some first responders that have had to quarantine. Uh, fortunately, none of them have turned out positive. And it's also a major concern with public works this time of the year. If we were to lose uh, half a dozen public works employees due to COVID, um, it might get tricky. Um, so that's my report. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet. Okay, John, I do want to commend you and the town employees for um, opening when you did open and being open uh, to general public as long as you did. Um, in talking with other first selectmen, I know uh, during this entire COVID um, tragedy, I guess, um, some towns never opened. Um, so I do, you know, commend you in, uh, for your hard work as well as the uh, town employees for their understanding and hard work as well. Any questions for the town manager? <clears throat> uh, if I, I may, we'll Scott, start. thank yep. you. And I want to second your commendation of the town employees. It's not just the first responders, though. They're doing a fabulous job. I want to thank all the employees, the library employees, the senior citizens, the Parks and Rec, that are dealing in a very unique situation, coming up with new programs, new way to continue services. Um, they've been a great bunch, and they've been you know, working their tails off to provide as much service as they can to the public. So I want to thank them as well. True, you're here. Any questions for town manager? <clears throat> yes, Scott, I had one. Yes. Uh, I've heard that there's gonna be distributions of the vaccine possibly starting next week. Uh, is there any activity the town is taking uh, with respect to that, knowing that they're gonna go to nursing homes and first responders first, or is that not a town function distributing the vaccine to people who want it? It's, it's in flux. Um, to answer the last part first, it's not a town function, though our emergency management director, Eric Benson, has been working with Region 3 of Demas uh, to line up uh, early vaccination of the police, ambulance, and fire department. Um, I had heard from the governor's conference last week that December 14th was going to be the first day of the rollout. I think that's been pushed back because Pfizer's indicated that they are having troubles obtaining some of the raw materials and they're not going to produce as much and as soon as they thought. Um, checking at the hospitals, they've received no plans as of today. They don't know when it's going to be rolled out. My understanding, again, from the governor's conference is the individuals at the top of the list will be the hospital workers and nursing home occupants. Uh, hopefully after that will be first responders. There was a request to have public works employees deemed to be first responders. And that so far has not been accepted by the Connecticut DPH. So with, as with most of this, the details are still being fleshed out or written out um, as we speak. So it's not a town function, but we will work with them to get the vaccine, if they need any help, if they need a stage in area, we can certainly do that at the senior center. If they need help getting supplies to Meadowbrook, 
you know, public works will be glad to do that. But so far, we've heard more broad theory than um, spelled out details. Any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to yep. uh, check status on a few things. Um, uh, so in, at the beginning of the call, Hope mentioned the, um, the mirror, the trash issue. And John, I remember you saying, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago that you and Mr. Severance, I think, were attending some meetings in Hartford around the state's new trash strategy, something like that. Do you, do you have a quick update at all on what's going on and or what the, the timetable might be looking like? Yes, they're still going through the tail or they're at the tail end of the workshops now. <clears throat> I believe there's a final meeting this coming or this week and they will be uh, producing the final recommendation. As Senator Whitco said, um, the push is going to be on a pay as you throw model, which I don't know if that's personally going to solve all the problems. Uh, I think you know, right now we've got a system where people pay for their trash removal through their taxes. <clears throat> if we change it to an alternative version where you have to pay uh, primarily by buying special bags, um, I don't think that's going to please the public all that well. There's talk about mandatory composting. Again, not too many details on that. Uh, it was announced either Thursday or Friday um, that Mira will definitely be shutting down as a trash to energy plant by uh, 2022. Uh, and as you heard Senator Withko say, it'll be transferred into a transfer station, which basically means the trash will be brought there <clears throat> and loaded onto rail cars and brought out to, I believe Ohio is gonna be the main recipient of the trash. The state does not seem interested in a statewide solution to mirror. Um, and as Senator Wickos indicated, he's been working the issue for a good two years. Um, and as you know, John Adams um, from Granby is on the board of directors of Mirror, along with Jim Hayden of East Granby and Don Stein of Park Hampstead. So we've had a lot of local representation on that and none of them are optimistic um, that the state's going to be assisting us except through one of these alternative programs such as pay as you throw, which um, I won't say anything until I see further details on it. Um, there's also a push, basically as it turns out, recycling never saved money. Even if you go back to the 60s and, <clears throat> and 70s, recycling never paid for itself, but it was good PR. And now there's talk about only recycling certain types of glass. And I think they're going to move to abolish single stream, which is unfortunate because I know many private vendors and municipalities have invested in very expensive equipment to pick up single stream. Uh, there is a push. CCM is advocating for a stronger bottle return bill uh, that will entice more people to bring the bottles back to the grocery store. I think basically increasing the deposit <coughs> from five cents to 10 cents. Um, but certain types of glass are profitable, but that's about it. And it looks like the single stream is a problem because everything gets mixed together. Um, and a lot of it winds up being contaminated by food product. But to summarize, uh, DEEP will be rolling out their recommendations sometime in the next two weeks. Um, Mira will be shutting down as a trash to energy plant 
no later than 2022. Our contract along with most of them runs through 2027. So they'll still remove our trash. It just won't be burnt. It'll be buried somewhere in Ohio. Okay, thank you. Any other okay. questions? Just a couple, yeah, a couple more quick things, sorry. Um, the the bear ordinance, um, that's basically in our lap, I think, at this point, right? We're not waiting on anything from you, John, or right. anyone. Yeah. Um, and then um, we had a special meeting last week on the um, the implementation tasks for the plan of conservation and development. And I, if I remember correctly, the implementation committee is going to take them, shuffle them around and then get them back to us. Is there, a, is there a time frame around that, either when they'll be meeting next or when we can expect the revised list back from them? Honestly, I have not um, established that since we met on Thursday, but <laughs> I did forward the results of our meeting on Thursday to Mrs. Kenyon on Friday. Um, and it's so Monday. knowing her usual efficiency, she's sending them to POCD if she didn't already do it today. So it'll probably be a question of when she can gather the committee back together. So I'll check with her tomorrow, <clears throat> but I think it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. Um, That's good. That's you good. know, our part's done. Any other right. questions? Yeah, and then um, back in October, we got some uh, sample budget documents, um, I think from the town of Middlefield, Maybe uh, Bill Glick submitted those and said, maybe we should take a look at them. Is there, is there any action on your part or? Those were forwarded to the Board of Finance as well. And they yeah. discussed them. And I, I believe, according to Mike, um, it's not comparing apples to apples. It's a much smaller town, much smaller budget. Um, so I was just looking for clarification from John, whether he and or anyone in the finance area had any intention to, I guess, do anything with those in, independent of. Board of finance. Yeah, all of that, yeah. Well, I've looked at them. I'll review them in more depth, but it's, you know, we, we've got our own budget process that we've been working on adapting and evolving every year. I know Mrs. Chang has already implemented quite a few changes. So, <clears throat> no, I haven't done anything otherwise with um, those middle field ones. Uh, it's, as Scott said, you know, it, it's something of apples to oranges. I'd be glad to look at them, but, you know, it's, I'm not going to put our budget on hold till I look at them. Yeah, okay. understood. Yeah, I'm just any other questions? questions. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay. At this point, I will. Let's see. Oh, selectman reports. Yes, yeah, selectman reports. Wait, didn't we? No, we didn't do first selectman report. Sorry. I, uh, John really talked about, I attended the uh, governor's conference uh, via uh, Zoom like John did. It was a long conference for really getting uh, no information from the governor. Um, what it uh, entailed was, it was rumored that it was, um, that the state was gonna shut down so uh, the governor just basically said there's no changes uh, at this point. He was going to take it day by day, uh, week by week in terms of uh, COVID. So we'll see what, what happens with that. But John gave a pretty good synopsis of, of uh, what was discussed. So with that, moving on to selectmen reports. Any selectmen have anything to report? No, not for me, Scott. All right, anyone? Just uh, Scott, the IBAC committee, Matt. IBAC, yes, we did meet. Yeah, right. so IBAC met and we uh, 
tasks, a couple things uh, for, for the town manager and the um, superintendent of schools, uh, following up on the suggestions of the last night back on technology changes. So they're gonna look at a plan of, um, you know, possible ways of working together, sharing information, integrating together, how that may work out. And, you know, with the COVID and everything else that's happening, it'll probably be a little longer time for them to uh, do some analysis or follow up on the previous reports. But uh, so that's in process. Thanks for being if I may, uh, I do have a meeting. Um, I'm just trying to pull up my calendar now. Uh, yep, Thursday with the superintendent uh, to go over the action items. Um, Sounds good. So we can report back. I believe it's on, is it the 16th we report back? But anyway, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the superintendent and I. Uh, he set up a meeting for us to meet this Thursday with one of his IT people to start discussing some of these items. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Seeing none, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. There's a second. Second. Okay. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention motion carries. Thank you, folks, and good night.